here so that when you've done the will of God, so you know whatever it is that God's told you to do, you've been obedient to that thing, you've stepped out in that thing, as a result, what's going to happen? You will receive what he has promised. My goodness, that was just so beautifully penned. I don't normally study out of the NIV, but for our purposes, it was important, all right? And so... Mm -mm -mm. When Jesus prays, Matthew 26, 36 through 46. So we've got 10 verses. Y'all be able to hang with me here. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and do what? And pray. Verse 37. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Let's read on. Then he returned his disciples and found them what? Sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. That's a wonderful admonition that you and I should be taking heed to even yet today. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Last two verses. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. How many of us know that when Jesus is praying, we ought to sit up and take notice, right? Paying attention to how it is that he prayed. So there's a whole lot in there, but this was a place of intimate prayer. Many of us, if we were raised in denominationalism, we were taught that the Lord's Prayer was the way that Jesus prayed. But in fact, he was using that as a template or a model to teach us how to pray, what we should include in the content of our communion with God, right? And so I believe it's also because of this, if we are left to our own devices in how we pray, we have a tendency to pray supplicating prayers. What does that mean? Prayers of God, please. I need you help and this sort of a thing. I want, you know, that kind of self-focused, right? And so this says a lot about Jesus right here. So we need to take pause for just a second because three times he asks the Lord, if this cup can pass by me, that's what I would prefer. So in that moment, he's operating as the son of man. And then he goes on and he prays, but not my will, but yours be done. So in that moment, he's operating as the son of man anointed by the Holy Spirit, right? Because you and I can't do something that we're called to do that's outside of our strength and our ability, apart from the anointing of the Holy Spirit, no matter what that is, fill in the blank, we can't do it unless we receive the cup, okay? Now, we understand what Jesus was being asked was something that was all sacrificing, right? So it's hard for us to wrap our minds around such a thing. Maybe, maybe in this life, the missionary can, you know, join forces, if you will, and understand this, understanding what it is that they're being asked to do and how it is that they're asked to follow the Lord. 
But in biblical antiquity, guys, this is really fascinating because there was such a thing as a cupbearer called to the king, right? And the cupbearer did what? The cupbearer was called to drink of the cup before it was placed before the king. Because why? Anybody know? Because if you wanted to kill a king, that was a great way to kill a king. Go ahead and put a little poison in his drink. And as a result, nobody would be the wiser and you could take him out. But our king. Whew, not my will, but yours be done. He willingly took the cup knowing it was poisoned. You understand what I'm saying? Metaphorically speaking, he willingly laid his life down. It's a marvel to all of humankind. That kind of sacrifice, that kind of love displayed on our behalf, man, you and I, let's just stay in a place of remembrance of what he's done for us. You know, we can do that on purpose, literally every day, partaking of the communion table every day. And so normally we receive from the communion table, right, every second Sunday of the month, but we really felt prompted to just go ahead and receive it every week through Easter, just putting ourselves in remembrance of this cup that he gladly received who for the joy that was set before him, he endured not only the cup, but the cross for you and for me. Wow. And so <clears throat> today's title is Confidence Under Pressure. I dare say that our Lord and Savior had some serious confidence under pressure. There wouldn't be uh, something that would be comparable to that in this life, the amount of pressure that was brought to bear in his life. And so I want you to think about this. We all need a cup. What do I mean by that? God's assignment. And if God has assigned you to it, not only will it require you to have a hard lean on him, right? Because we can't do it in our own strength. But in addition to that, I want you to see this. Confidence under pressure. C-U-P. Oh, wow. Amen? Just grab that as truth for you. Because sometimes he'll call you to do something that will cause you to really be challenged in your faith. But it's a great place to live. It's a wonderful place to live. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm just curious, by a show of hands, how many of us, you would say that you're really good under pressure? You just be, raise your, hand, raise your hands up nice and high. Keep your hands up for just a minute. About, about half of us. Kind of maybe depends on what kind of pressure. Sure, yeah. How many of us, you'd be honest and you'd say, no, nope, I choke under pressure. No, no, I don't, I'm not so good with pressure. Now, see, I will say this. I don't like pressuring people, so I have a tendency to say a lot as the Lord was dealing with me on this message. Uh, oh, no pressure, no pressure, right? If you talked with me before, yeah. Because I don't like feeling that pressure that the enemy tries to push on us or that even well-meaning folks sometimes, those expectations, you know what I'm saying? So I try not to do that to other people. But nevertheless, we live in a life where there's pressure. Every day there's pressure. Every moment of every day there's pressure. And so we're going to look at some things along those lines, okay? And so as we're thinking about this, and we'd say, you know what? I really wanted to raise my hand when she asked if I fare well under pressure because I want to be a champion with regard to this pressure thing. Yeah, that's all great and fine and wonderful, but I'll say this. Sometimes, sometimes, those of us, I'm telling on myself, sometimes we become really good under pressure, because we're procrastinators, right? And so we have to then, <laughs> come on now, we have to put, it's crunch time, so we have to put the pedal to the metal, so to speak, and so we've become really good crisis managers, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, but usually those types of individuals, things come really easy for them, and so they're able to push it 
But what's happening is they're not bringing their very best because they didn't allow that beautiful process of time to grow and develop and nurture and practice and whatever else is required to develop that thing that you're called to so that you're not having to be in a place of undue pressure. Okay? All right. And so now... There is a movie, and uh, it's rated R, but I saw the, so we're not going to show it. And so, because um, we don't personally watch rated R movies, no, no condemnation to anybody else, but that we just don't. And so, <clears throat> but there is an opening scene that I was told about, and it is a story about King, uh, what was his name, George the sixth, okay? And so he was a king of the UK, and he didn't want to become king, but through a series of, you know, just family, this is what happens, and you, you know, his monarchy was going to happen whether he wanted it or not, okay? And so he ends up in this opening scene, and he's walking up to this podium uh, in the beginning of his reign, and all these people are there, his subjects, if you will, and this is in the 30s, 1930s, and they're all waiting for him to speak, but see, here was the quandary. He had a stutter, a pronounced stutter. See, Dr. Pamela follows the monarchy over there. And so I'm sure you've done all this research to that end. She's nodding her head. Oh, you, okay, okay. All right, we'll pray for you later. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. But, but this opening scene, you can see this trailer. So this is really fascinating. He comes up. You've got all these people. <clears throat> and they're waiting they're waiting perched. What are you going to say? And he's got this pronounced stutter, right? And so he is absolutely terrified. Thank you so much, sweetheart. That was very kind. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's good stuff. And so I began to think about that. Did you know that the number one fear, number one fear, what is it? It's public speaking. Number two fear. Do you know what the public two, uh, number two, public fear. <laughs> the number two fear. The dentist, that would be your pastor. That's so funny. No, he's, he's like four, I think, four or five. <clears throat> number two, fear of death, fear of death. Number three, snakes. Okay, so now think about this. Most people in this room would rather go on to be with Jesus than be told, hey, by the way, next week you're going to be bringing the word next week. Most people would rather, isn't that funny? Right. And I totally get it. I totally get it. But I want you to think about this. It's not a bad thing to, if you will, <clears throat> continue on in a little bit of a shudder kind of a posture when you're talking about the infallible, incorruptible seed of the word of God and you're responsible to give it to people and their eternities hang in the balance right? That's a, that's a weighty matter, and it should never be taken to a place where we think, ah, I can do this. That's right. Never, never, never. That's not a good place. It's not a good place to be. So think about this, though, guys. If we were honest, most of us would say this. I may not have this assignment to publicly speak, okay? Now, I've told some of you my story before since we have teenagers in here. I'll share it again. So when I was in the seventh grade, <clears throat> I had the first opportunity to uh, public speak for the first time. And it was a wonderful experience. Uh, it's warm and fuzzy. It was actually our sex education class at the Catholic school. And I was, of all the systems of the body, assigned the male reproductive system. And I thought my teacher had lost her mind. Because why would that be a logical choice? It makes no, no sense whatsoever. And so dad, dad had to receive my lesson in the advance. And I'll never forget, he just stood, he stood up and he goes, well, honey, you know more than I do. Okay. And walks, <laughs> walks promptly out of the room, and to which I was mortified. So then, to add insult to injury, I play first base. So I take a hard hard ball right to the kisser got this huge swollen lip ice pack going so i've got big lip ice pack and i'm teaching the class about the male reproductive system yes i believe for the next five years i was completely tortured it was awful and i swore and i'm teased now but i swore that nope 
I'm good. We're good. Any kind of oral report, any kind of public speech, we're going to do extra work just to get out of that. Absolutely. So I do understand why it is the number one fear. Absolutely. So maybe that's not you today, but what if it is a pressure to perform or a pressure to fit in? Or what about deadlines? They loom large on the horizon, right? Deadlines don't move. What about meeting other people's expectations? What about meeting other people's unrealistic expectations? What about meeting your own expectations and you feel like you fall short every day? We've all been there, right? What about your expectation to be a better husband or a better wife or a better friend or a better this or a better that? And it's a constant press, therefore pressure, right? Now, do we want to grow? Yes. But do we want to become anxious? Do we want to become, how should I say, so pressure filled that we're about to explode? No. What about financial pressure, family pressure? The list goes on and on and on. So pressure literally can come from anywhere. And pressure does not discriminate. It comes to all of us, no matter where we are, no matter who we are, equally. Okay? And so <clears throat> what about this? Pressure to get married. Oh, are you still single? You still, you still single? Well, what? what? Why is that? Yeah, pressure. What about pressure to have babies? Pressure. Well, aren't you about whatever age? Pressure. People don't mean it, but little comments sometimes are made, and then pressure comes, right? Right? If we're honest, what about this? I can tell on myself. Uh, pressure to lose weight. So for a long time, 20-plus years, right, I needed to lose weight. And I remember this little girl, her mama sent her over to me in the park, and I was like, I love you and your mama. Because, wow, and she rubbed my belly, and she goes, do you have a baby in there? And I was like, oh, his name is Frederick, and he's my food baby. <laughs> nope. <clears throat> nope. I'm using Erica's. That's her name for her food baby. She, she tells me. It's so funny. And so, yeah, she loves Frederick, by the way, so it's, we're good. And so, but what about that, guys? What about social media pressure? I mean, especially our younger generation. Oh my gosh, the pressure to get just the right selfie. It's ridiculous, you know? And then that they, their life doesn't look Pinterest perfect or whatever. It's absolutely ridiculous, the pressure, and it continues to mount. And so I believe it would be incumbent upon me to say this today. You have a call you have a divine destiny. You have a purpose. And this is thus the reason why it is important to be able to handle pressure and not only handle it, not just cope with it as the world would want you to cope with it, but to have confidence under pressure that you know who's called you to it and you know who's going to deliver you through it. Amen? That's it. I mean, that's the bottom line for me. So, and we know this, the enemy cannot touch your call. Scripturally speaking, he cannot touch your call. Because why? Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says that the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance, right? So we, you and I, I wouldn't suggest it, but you and I can literally be living outside of the will of God and the gifts and the calling of God are still resident in your life. They could be squandered. They could be misappropriated. But at the end of the day, they'll not be revoked, according to Scripture. So the enemy can't touch your call, but he can mess with your confidence. He absolutely can mess with your confidence. And if he gets you scared enough, if he gets you shaking enough, he will get you to back up from what God has called you to do and stay comfortable rather than step out in that place of confidence. Okay? So with this, mm -mm -mm. It's also important to know that as you yield, which is a good thing, right? Because we're walking out in obedience. But as you and I yield to that call in our lives, it's like this. This is what I see in the realm of the spirit, if you will, when we're praying. It's like you stood up and said, here I am, Lord, use me. And when you do that, you become what? A target, right? So we must understand 
the schemes and the plan of the enemy and understand how he works so that we can remain perched in that place of confidence even under pressure. And so it's like this. So here comes not only pressure, but a spiritual pressure. Let me clarify it even further. A demonic spiritual pressure that's brought to bear to get you to give up and quit. Now, it might come by way of looking and sort of, how should I say, seeking out weak spots in your life. Okay? Okay. And so we'll start to pick those weak spots because now you've stepped up. Now you're purposing to step out. Now you're purposing to obey God. You need to start picking at those weak spots. He's going to start looking for opportunities where your character, your integrity is questionable, right? And so those things could become exposed. So it's really important to A, be on time with God, right, that we're readied and those things aren't then tripping hazards for us, but at the same time, understanding that you're never, ever, I'm never going to be in a place of perfection before we can obey God. Amen? Amen. And I love the way Rick Renner teaches this. So in Timothy, the books to Timothy, or the epistles, I should say, to Timothy and to Titus, there is a little word that's in there in most of the renderings, and it's translated in English, blameless, okay? And it literally means this, having no fault, so glaring, in other words, it's blinding, that it impedes somebody from following you, okay? We're always going to have flaws. We're always going to have shortcomings. But we're talking about an, an issue, right, that's so blinding that it's impeding people from following. Make sense? So we're talking about our call. We're talking about stepping out and trusting him in this. And so we want to remember that pressure, guys, this is how the Lord dropped it in my heart, is an EOE, an equal opportunity employer. Again, it will come to absolutely every one of us, right? And our natural human tendency is to want to escape it. And that is, isn't even a good thing as well. So Philippians 3, 13 and 14. We're going to actually look at this in the New King James. Is that good? If you have an opportunity to turn there yourself, let's do that. <clears throat> oh, my goodness. Are you all doing all right? <clears throat> You're working with me today because I tell you what, it was a big day yesterday. It was indeed. Let's see here. Where's Philippians? <laughs> That's priceless. I have them marked and everything. There we go. It says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. In other words, this is Paul saying to the church at Philippi, and he's speaking to those even yet today, I don't consider myself to have arrived, but one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind. So on purpose, as an act of my will, I forget those things that are behind, and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I what? Press. So he's pushing back on the pressure, right? Look at this. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So in context, it's denoting and, and letting us know out in the advance, there's going to be a little pushback, guys. So you're going to have to press into it and press through it. But you're graced. You're graced. He wouldn't give you a cup that you weren't graced to receive and to partake of. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. He's faithful like that, guys. He is absolutely faithful. And so, <clears throat> I believe this. We could say it like this. Pressure is the litmus test to gauge how confident we are in what it is that he's called us to do. So, the Lord put some things in my heart, and so I'm just going to be, be upfront and honest with you. What if, what if, since public speaking is the number one fear, what if next Sunday you were called on and you're going to preach next Sunday, okay? What if, what if that were something that God called you to? What if next Sunday, instead of here, your pulpit was down on Del Mar in St. Louis? What if it was the nursing home? 
What if your pulpit was in kids? What changed? Location? Audience? Position. And as a result of all three of those, you all three tagged it. As a result of all three of those, what changes in your confidence? Hmm? Think about it. You're terrified about the idea of going out on Delmar, right? Here, a little less terrifying because it's family. Kids, uh, they're going to be throwing things at me, so you know it's good. <laughs> I'm teasing. They don't really do that, but they don't do that in my class, okay? They, like, legit don't do that. Anyway, but, but I have known them to do this, so let's, let's yes. <laughs> and so, but think about that. We somehow change our viewpoint as to our can-do ability based on location, position, and audience. We change how we perceive our ability to do it, and yet nothing's really changed unless we decide for it to change. Whatever he's called us to, whatever he's called us to, there is grace that comes with that cup. Man, it's so helpful. All right, and so I believe this. If you and I will ready ourselves, so this is a singular application, but the application in reality is wide and vast, right, as far as this confidence under pressure. We're just using this as an example since it's the number one fear, right? But if I prepare as if I'm preaching to an audience of one, just one, just one, it doesn't matter the position or the location or the audience, does it? Because we can be confident in Christ because we're only preaching to an audience of one. When we recently saw Rick Renner and when Pastor had gotten to see him back in Tulsa, he's not in the States terribly often. And, uh, you know, here is such a precious and humble man of God. But when he preaches, he literally, he's like this the whole time. He's just talking to Jesus. It's so precious. Mm. Yeah. He's so faithful. He's so faithful to grace you with what it is that you have need of to fulfill the bigness of the call of God on your life. Pressure will show us what we're made of. Pressure comes when things are not exactly like we'd like them to be, right? It's easy to love our friends when they're lovely. It's easy to love our spouse when they're wonderful. It's easy to love kids that aren't talking back to us, right? Not doing stuff that we wish they weren't doing. It's easy to praise God when we feel good, but are we willing to come in and lift our hands and praise him when our body is screaming something else? Right? That's pressure. That's pressure. And its constancy in our lives requires that we learn how to live in a place of confidence in him. And so I started thinking about the four men in the fiery furnace, right? So it's one thing when God sends us flowers, but it's another when the cup finds us standing in front of the furnace. That's another thing altogether. Hmm. I also started thinking about this, and I'd heard it preached lots and lots of times, that diamonds are created from coal under pressure. But did you know that's not true? That's actually not true. Yeah. Says the science teacher. With the kids. It actually isn't true. 
I'd heard that preached so many times. However, what is true, what is required, it's made from, diamonds are made from carbon, and it requires, they require high heat, extreme pressure over long periods of time. So pressure in and of itself is not good or evil. Really, the reality is, is how do we respond to it is the difference, right? James 1, 2 through 4. Let's look there, guys. James 1, 2 through 4. And I got to say, I wasn't quite sure how this was going to flow today as far as how this would be delivered. But I knew that the message was real big in my heart. So and it says this in verse 2, My brethren again, my brethren, Pastor James here, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, sounds like pressure to me, produces something. There is a product of the testing of our faith. It produces what? Patience. Patience. But see, we try to skirt around pressure because our humanness does not like it. Mm -mm. No, no. Our humanness absolutely does not like it. And so can we talk for just a second about a couple of things? So there is a very real enemy out there. And the moment that you said yes to Jesus, you got on his hit list. We understand that, right? The moment you said yes. Matter of fact, even before that, I believe that he literally hates all of humanity. This is my opinion because we're made in the very image of God, yeah. right? And then when we move from that of being a, a creation to that of a child, the reality is, is we took his job. So he's kind of, you know, got a little stinky face toward us. He's not too happy with us. You understand. I'm kidding in some of this. But nevertheless, we have a very real personification of evil in the earth, that is perched and arrayed against us. So we must understand this. And so <clears throat> there seems to be additionally for Christians, so that's one point of pressure, spiritual pressure, but there is this unrealistic expectation for Christians, it seems, that everything is okay. Yeah. You doing okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. You doing okay? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And then well, I hear this a lot. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Yep, he is. I didn't ask you if God was good. I asked if you were good. Right? Come on now. Because we have this thing, for whatever reason, that I got to say, everything's okay. And I can't dare be honest. That maybe everything isn't okay. Right? I'm not saying we go and share that with the world. You got to know who your confidants are. You understand. You got to know who's going to stand in faith with you. But sometimes we have to, how should I say, expose the issue so that we can rightly pray, how should I say, in a place of authority over it, in it, through it, and get onto the other side of that thing. So did you know in 2007, this struck me as so interesting, there was a new system that was put in every vehicle in the United States, made in the United States, and it's called this, the TPMS, the Tire Pressure monitoring system, right? So when your tires are either too full or too empty, you get a little gauge that goes off, right? Interesting, interesting. Why did they do that? There were too many tire blowouts, too many blowouts. And what's interesting, when I did a little research to this end, it I would automatically have assumed that that was as a result of too much pressure. But did you know more often than not, it happens because there's too little pressure. And so when the weight of the car comes and anything else additional to that, and as it's traveling down the road and it hits these bumps and potholes and all these things as we travel down the road of life, hello, and then blowouts occur as a result because there's not enough pressure, not enough pressure. So what happens, how many of you have ever filled your tires? Most everybody in the room. Do you know where to check? This is a little, you know, my dad owned car dealerships. Uh, and so he required us to do some things because he had no boys. Let's just leave it at that. So anyway, do you know where to find the, the amount of pressure that you need in your tires on your car? Do you know where to find that? Not as many hands went up. Okay. <laughs> Pastor, tell them where it's at on most cars. What was that? On the tire? Is it on the tire? I thought it was inside the door. 
It's both. Okay, okay. I've never looked at the tire. I learned something new. There you go. Oh, there you go. It's free, free, free information today. There you go. My sister knows this well about our father. Anyway. <laughs> so, with this in mind, there is a particular about that you're supposed to have in your tires, right? So, what happens when you don't have that right amount? Car doesn't ride well. Put yourself in jeopardy if it's too far off, that kind of thing. And so there is a resulting effect if we don't make sure that we have the right amount of pressure. Mm, 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 mm. Now, I want to say it like this. For some of us, we tend to avoid all kinds of pressure, right? So here's the thing, though, how the Lord dropped it in my heart is our lives can feel like they're becoming too complicated on the one end when there's too much pressure, but flip it over to the other side, we get too comfortable, too comfortable, okay? It's so true, isn't it? When we avoid all pressure, and again, neither end is good. So 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9, we're going to again look to the screen for this, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9, Look at this. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. Now, this is Paul speaking. This is really interesting and not a, an often read passage. We were under, what does Paul say? Great, wait a minute. Paul, the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul of faith, said what? We were under great pressure, far beyond, so he measures it for us, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Let's read the first part of 9. Indeed, we felt like we had received the sentence of death. Well, let's read the rest of it. It's not a real part of our, but, this is so good, but, this happened that we might not Rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So even in that, even in that, just like Jesus who received the cup, knowing that it was poison, he also knew that death would not have its way. They both knew that death would not have its way and would not have its say. Praise God. And so I'll tell you this. I think it's really important for us to also look at Luke's gospel, chapter 22. Luke is the only gospel writer that includes some key words, and I think it's important. Luke 22, 39 and 40. Luke 22, 39 and 40. The clock says double zeros back there, so we have lots of time. I'm just kidding. Luke 22, 39. Here we go. Jesus went out. What does it say? As usual, two little words you might want to underline in your Bible, to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Interesting. He went there as usual. Where was there? Gethsemane, right? He was there as usual. This was customary, a customary practice for him to go and play, pray, excuse me, in his place. And so Matthew 26, 36 and 37, Matthew 26, 36 and 37 says this. And Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And when he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray, Next verse, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled, but this was a usual place for him. So there is a difference, guys, between a storm that comes and tries to hit our lives or our house or whatever it might be, but it's different when that storm hits our heart. See, that storm was hitting his heart, and he wanted that cup to pass him by. He didn't want in his own humanness to yield to that. When the pressure is on, I want you to notice something here. He took three people with him, didn't he? Who were these two sons of Zebedee? Anybody know? James and John. That's right. 
So he took Peter, James, and John. And I can just picture these other disciples over there like, hey, Jesus, did you forget us? Did you forget? We want, we want to go too. Yeah. Guys, it's important for you to know who your circle is when the pressure's on. It's real important. Those people got to be able to link arms in faith with you, praying you through, okay? So we could go right past that and miss that if we're not careful. And so it's important because sometimes, and the Lord reminded me about Samson with Delilah, she prostituted the pressure that he was under. Think about that, okay? You don't want somebody to take advantage of you when the pressure is on. And there are a lot of folks in life that will want to do that very thing. And maybe even in some situations, they don't even recognize that they're doing it. They don't even know that they're doing it, and yet it's happening. That manipulation, that control has been so interwoven in their lives, they don't even recognize that they're doing it. Am I telling the truth today? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. What about this? What about... Oh, my. Luke twenty two forty two through 44. I love this encouragement. Again, this is only in Luke's gospel. Father, if you are willing, here's Jesus again, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Did you know Dr. Luke was the only one to include that? An angel had come in the garden and strengthened him in the middle of his anguish, yeah, in the middle of it. I think for some of us, we're so busy looking at our loss. We're so busy looking who's left us that we've forgotten that the one who says he'll never leave us and never forsake us is right there with us. Amen. And so we're going to receive communion together this morning. And uh, I know this is a uh, it's actually a candy dish, but it's as close as we're going to get to a, a chalice right now. And uh, But it reminded me so much of the cup that he had to receive. And it was a full cup. And the guys were so gracious to fill it full because it wasn't just a sparse dose of what it was that he did for us. It was overflowing. And so he had to receive it with tender care. Mm. And if the contents of this cup were representative of you and I and the sins that we had committed in the past, are currently doing, or will do in the future, all of it is contained in that cup. He literally partook of the cup for the sins of the entire world. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. And so we're just reminded from 1 Corinthians that it says on the night he was betrayed, he took that cup. And he gave thanks. And he said yes. And so, Father, in the same way, we receive from the cup as the elements are passed out, guys. And, Father, we ready our hearts this morning specifically, Lord, we know that we, we will partake and receive of both the cup and the bread. But, Father, we zero in on the cup this morning, on the blood that was spilled at the cross at Calvary for us. And as we're receiving our our elements, guys, you know, I just was thinking hmm, this phrase, never let them see you sweat, right? Thank you. Never let them see you sweat. And yet Jesus, and yet Jesus sweated great drops of blood. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just put ourselves in remembrance this day of the sacrifice that you paid. And we thank you that we can readily receive the cup that you're offering to us, the cup of the call. Father, we say yes. 
we say yes and we say yes again. We want to live a life of obedience because in that place, there's safety, there's protection, there's provision. And we thank you, Father, for your leadership. We thank you, Father, for your stewardship. You are so faithful to us. And we thank you, Lord God, that you're watching over our lives. Hallelujah. And so I just encourage you to lift the cup and say, Father, I receive forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And in the same way, he took the bread and he broke it, symbolic of the breaking of his own body. And Father, we thank you that because Jesus' body was broken, we might be whole. And we receive that wholeness right now in Jesus' name. Take and eat. And as you've received, guys, if you're able to stand. Let's just take a moment in quiet. You know, I think sometimes we just like really filling the air. And when I was in Minnesota and there was this beautiful 24-hour ongoing prayer meeting, it was so precious that this church had learned, had been bathed in prayer for so many years that they knew how to just be quiet before the Lord. And guys, I'm going to ask you to do something really special right now. And I'm not looking to embarrass anybody. I'm not looking to call anybody out. But I want to make sure with an absolute confidence that everybody is right with God before we leave today. I want to make absolutely sure. I believe that you're here today not on accident, but by design that God shows you to be here today on purpose. And so I'm going to ask if you just lift your hand up and then down and you say, I need Jesus, man. I need Jesus. Would you just pray for me? Thank you for those hands. Anybody else? Thank you for that hand, Jed. Anybody else? Man, pray for me today. I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we pray this together? Dear Heavenly Father, with my whole heart, I give you my life. Whatever it is, whatever I have, it's yours. I believe that Jesus died for me. He's the Son of God, and I receive a fresh start, freedom from my past, freedom from sin, and a new day has dawned over my life. I receive everything you have for me. This moment forward, in Jesus' name. And Father, I ask you. No, 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 I'm just going to pray this. Father, I ask you, I ask you to bless them. To protect them. To meet with them to make yourself known to them through your precious Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for the next steps forward, that they make decisions yes and yes and yes again to grow in you. And Lord, I thank you for this moment in time. I pray it's a marker in their lives that from this day forward, everything begins to change. 
And would you do this? Would you look up at me, guys? Would you just know this, okay? Nothing changed on the outside, but on the inside, everything changed because ultimately we're a three-part being. We're spirit, soul, and body. So this tent that you see here really isn't even me. There's a spirit on the inside that's eternal, right? And so that eternal part is born again in a moment. The Bible says you're literally made new in a moment. Isn't it a great thing to know that in God we get a second chance and a 50-second chance and a 100-second chance? I'm so grateful, so grateful for that. And so, man, just know that today everything begins to change, okay? And so we've got materials that will help you get started in God. And one of the best things that you could do to read is 157 times in this Bible, it says who you are in Christ. And it's how you identify, how I identify in my new nature, in my new life in Christ. So when I come to know how he sees me, how he loves me, everything changes. Everything changes. So we bless you guys. I just thank you so much for today. Today was an unusual day. Yesterday was a day that we um, we hosted a funeral here. You may or may not know that uh, with Kim's family. And as they exited, you know, we were surprised, if you will.